as typically we begin with a, uh, a reference to the responsibility of the teacher. And I will just say this very quickly that uh, we are aware that sometimes that we uh, <laughs> overwhelm with a deluge sometimes of Bible quotes and pioneer scriptures. Uh, sometimes it take a little bit more time to digest and hopefully the notes that you have will do that. And um, I will say this, one of the reasons that we do that is uh, things that we read very early on from the pioneer brethren, namely Brother Thomas, um, and the many warnings that he gave about the modern day clergy and that they were clouds without water, relying upon their own great swelling words of vanity, enticing words of men to stir people when really the word doesn't need that at all. It doesn't need our explanation, it just needs exposition. So I do think that the clarity of the word becomes confusing when we start compounding it with our own words. So that's why you always get a very large number of direct Bible quotes from me. And I apologize knowing that sometimes we go through them very, very quickly. Um, but we will ask you just to go back and review the notes. And here's a quote about the doctrine of God manifestation regarding the tabernacle from Brother H.B. Mansfield. And we'll ask you to read this from the notes in your spare time. It's encompasses all the principles that we've talked about, but it's uh, uh, corresponding with all the things that we've said to this point in time. Um, we're dealing now with the holy place, brothers and sisters, remembering again the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 1, verse 14, that he was the word made flesh that tabernacled among us. And when he had gone forth in prayer at the conclusion of his life, he noted that he had glorified the Father, that he'd finished the work that Yahweh had given him to do, that he manifested Yahweh's name among men. So he was the word made flesh dwelling among us, tabernacling in our midst. And his purpose was to glorify the Father, speaking only his words, doing only his works, and every sort of attention that he got personally, he directed back to the Father, even saying to one man, why callest thou me good? There is none good but the Father. So he glorified and manifested the Father, and he was the epitome of all the principles that we talk about. So we talked about the outer court last time and the pillars, and we even talked about the brazen altar and the labor and the dimensions of that. Um, and this week we go into the holy place, and we'll have to move fairly quickly into this, and we'll get with the altar of incense, God willing, in our next class. But we want to deal with the table <clears throat> upon which, in our reading, Exodus 25 and verse 30, was placed showbread always before God. So it's a table of showbread, and then also the lampstand, what they represent and their positioning inside this particular holy place. So they're not in the outer court, like the altar of burnt offering or the laver, but they are now in the holy place, not the most holy where the ark was and the mercy seat over it, but in the holy place. And so we had our brother read for us that you'll notice from the very beginning that it is called a table and it means to spread forth. And it is drawn directly with us because there's bread placed on it as we again have in verse 30. But verse 23 tells us it's a table. There is a connection between that red and that, that bread rather and the table of the Lord, of which Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 21, you cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be a partaker of the Lord's table and the table of devils. And, you know, in that chapter, he interchanges devils with idols because that's what they were. They were idols of the heathen. And then he says in Luke 22 that the cup is actually a cup of his blood representing a new covenant, which was shed. This is now not an animal. This is a man who shed his blood for the principles of a new covenant. And he says, but behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. So the table is a place that is represented as fellowship. And we notice the size of that, that it was two cubits, the length thereof, and a cubit will be the breadth thereof. It's not five cubits, four square, like we had in the altar of burnt offering. It's much smaller than the altar of burnt offering that was in the outer court. Well, principally, and this is one of the reasons I said from the beginning of these classes, I do like the subject matter of the tabernacle, because although there are more details given to the subject of the tabernacle and the temple and the scriptures, brothers and sisters, it is not at all 
hard or difficult by any means to track down what the type and anti-type of these represent. And furthermore, when we are given those illustrations and those shadows or types or parables, the exhortation that accompanies them, we know that it's in the right context now. There's no agenda. It's, a, it's an exhortational point that was, is in the proper context in the setting. So here in this table of showbread representing fellowship, we have a table that is smaller. And Brother Mansfield, the expositor, says that this table, therefore, was not large. Its measurements imply limitation, suggesting exclusiveness in fellowship. Now, you need to think about that because there are brethren that are on an agenda, relaxing principles of doctrine now that say we've got to be all one fellowship. We've got to be united regardless of what we do. Yet when it comes to this particular principle of a table of showbread, it is much, much smaller. At best, it's three feet by two feet. And we're giving it general and generous measurements there by U.S. standards. It tells us that really fellowship has never been about quantity, but quality. The masters have never been interested in the truth, brothers and sisters. So Brother Mansfield goes on to say, attendance at the table of Yahweh implies personal responsibility to conform to the spiritual etiquette required by those who partake thereof. And we mentioned that in the last class. People say, oh, just come back to the meeting. Well, you know, if they're living a life of rebellion, that's not appropriate. It's really not appropriate. It is a restricted fellowship for a reason. Straight is the gate, narrows the way of people that find life eternal. It is a very restrictive life. It's one for our benefit. And so we read, and this has been the basis of our classes on every other Thursday evening with uh, Brother Colin Hollenby, and that is we're going through the Birmingham Amended Statement of Faith. And the principle is set forth there in Acts 2. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread. You can't have fellowship and breaking of bread unless there's a unity of doctrine, continuing in the apostles' doctrine. So that breaking of bread and that fellowship coincide, and that's what we're talking about now. So in this principle, it was overlaid with pure gold, and there was a crown of gold round about it. Now, we've talked about this before, and I believe I said in an exhortation that gold represents tried faith. And uh, actually, Brother Colin Hollenby corrected me more accurately. He said the process of bringing forth faith is trial. It's not that gold in of itself represents tried faith. It's the purging of the character that brings forth gold, that is, in the context of 1 Peter 1 and 6 and 7. And he's correct by that. The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, is to be found unto praise and honor. So the ecclesia sometimes is in that state, brothers and sisters. It is a place of trial. Job brings that out. When I'm tried, then I come forth as gold. So it's the process of which we're involved. And there's a border about a handbreadth round about us. And when we use the Bible as its own dictionary, as we often do, we'll find that a handbreadth represents more of the tal mortality. Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth. Mine age is nothing before me. So we're people that are partaking of emblems in fellowship based on the apostles' doctrine, with a crown of gold round about it, seeking for life eternal, but we remember our mortality. We remember it. We remember what Yahweh is and his standard of fellowship, and we remember what we are. We are very mortal creatures. So this crown is something that is a reward for overcoming. We've addressed this before, and it's brought forth in James. The man that endureth difficulties and trials and temptations, when he's tried, he does get a reward in the style of crown of life. It's the same in the apocalypse. I will give thee a crown of life. There's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the righteous judge, and that's the title given to the Lord, will give me in that day and all those that love is appearing. And of course, the Lord Jesus Christ himself was crowned with glory and honor, though initially made a little lower than the angels. He's now been set over all the works 
of Yahweh's hands. And you know that will be a quote from Psalm 8 as the last Adam in representation. He is now in control of all the creation, and that will be ultimately manifest by his second advent. So we, again, have just gone through a couple of verses here, but we're told that it will have four rings of gold in it put into the four corners and the four feet thereof. And the rings were the places of the staves. And those staves were to bear the table to be made of shittim wood so that it could be borne up. And I just recently looked at this. I've never really inspected this word staves, knowing the principle of it. But it corresponded with the principle, and you'll find this in the expositor by Brother Mansfield. It literally means a part of the body. So here are individual members of the body, brothers and sisters, and we know how that's used throughout the New Testament. You'll know the references that cite that, that are elevating and lifting up the standard of fellowship. And that's very, very important. And they're set in the four corners of it. It's a fellowship that is encompassing for all that come into the truth based upon the apostles' doctrine and in breaking of bread and in fellowship. And we know the very distinct reasons, and we've addressed this before, we got into this in the altar of burnt offering. On the four corners of it were horns, and it was four square. And we know what that term means. There's no need to repeat it right here. It represents all people in these four corners, and what it represents that all, if they meet that criteria, can come into fellowship. And these rings and staves, they were individuals making up the whole elevating fellowship during this transporting period of the ecclesia in the wilderness where the cloud and the fire went where Yahweh directed that's where the ecclesia went they're anticipating the kingdom and the rest ultimately that Joshua gave them that sabbath rest that Hebrews 4 talks about eating it new with Christ in the in the kingdom and we know that brothers and sisters based on the principles of the very restricted size of that table, very, very small right now. Some people trying to widen it, saying that we're really being too picky about fellowship. And then there are other members in the ecclesia that are working, trying to put the staves in and to lift up the standard of fellowship. And there is no avoiding it. Those two principles collide ultimately in the ecclesial environment. Don't stress over it. It's why there is this crown of gold round about it and gold because gold comes in the condition of trial and the ecclesia quite often is the grounds for that trial. Do not let it frustrate you. He put the table in the tent of the congregation on the side of the tabernacle northward and he set the bread in order upon it before Yahweh. It's set there in his presence. Why on the north side, brothers and sisters? We know that Dan represented the northern encampment. It says that in Numbers 2, verse 25. And so then when we have the numbering, they numbered them from Dan to Beersheba. And Dan means judgment. We get that for how the child was named. We even get it in Ezekiel. That judgment was coming upon Israel, both the Assyrian and, of course, in the latter days. It was coming out of the north quarters. It represents the position of judgment. So here is this table of showbread, brothers and sisters. We're deliberately told the direction. It's the direction, according to Yahweh, we know the east represents the rising of the sun and enlightenment. And where the gospel goes ultimately to the west, we know that north represents judgment. And if you have your Bible dictionary, you can look at that at your spare time. So he wants that table of showbread to be set on the north side of this holy place. My apologies. And so what do we have here in 1 Corinthians 11? Though we come together, though it's placed in its four corners of these staves, and it does encompass all people that come under its criteria of the doctrine and fellowship, it is a place that we come together to remember one at the table. It is the table of the Lord. And the Apostle Paul says, in that place, we are to examine ourselves. If we don't, we eat and drink condemnation to ourselves. We have to discern the Lord's body personally. If we judge ourselves, 
we should not be judged. When we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. It's a place for personal inspection. In that inspection, coming by John 12 and verse 48, the quote in front of you, is a judgment that comes from the word. It is the only source of scrutiny we have in this day and age, brothers and sisters. It is the word of God. It is not as if Christ is going to appear. And judgment begins at the house of God. We're told that by Peter. He's going to assess us according to some things he forgot that are not written by holy guided inspiration by the Father and the Word of God. It's everything that's contained in the Law, Prophets, Psalms, and all the New Testament scriptures. We know by what standard we will be judged. So that when we come before the breaking of bread, the showbread, as the expression in Exodus is, the type and antitype, and means the presence of faces. It means making face. It's Yahweh's face, and our face coming de- together in judgment on the north side. It's a time that we scrutinize ourselves, brothers and sisters. And some people see the ecclesia in a totally different light than that. It is a place for socializing. It is a place to get together with people that we get along with. And really the word starts fading into the background very quickly. It is a place that we fix upon the Lord and we discern the Lord and what he did. We examine ourselves, we judge ourselves, whether we be of the faith. That's what the Ecclesia is about. And then, what is on that table? On that table is something made of fine flour, ground into fine flour, and bacon cakes of 12, and two tenths deals in one. And of this 12, we know that's a number representing Israel. We're two rows with six in a row. And we know what that represents, brothers and sisters. It represents Jew and Gentile, the two peoples of humanity that make up the body of Christ. And we know what the body represents. Christ said, this bread represents his body. And that body is the Israel of God, and it consists of fine flour. Brethren, ground and purified by the principles of the truth that are the hope of Israel united together, put in two rows. They are both people of flesh. That when they come together on the principles fellowship by the Redeemer Christ, they make up the Israel of God. It was to be a memorial before them, and Aaron and his sons every Sabbath were to eat it. It was set in order every Sabbath, and they were to eat it, and they were to eat it, brothers and sisters. It says there in verse 9 of Leviticus 24, in the holy place. That's the only place that it could be eaten, was in the holy place. And what's the importance of that? I remember some 25 years ago, the very first time, I met a brother and sister I'm very close to, Brother David and Sister Christy Perry. And they said to me, and I knew he would get on very quickly. And they said to me, you lose Israel, you lose the truth. You lose Israel and you lose the truth. There are 12 cakes here, brothers and sisters. And we don't see the dominance of this word so much in Christadelphian writings today. We don't see the hope of Israel, the kingdom about Israel, the exposition of Israel. Look at our statement of faith. It says the kingdom which he will establish will be the kingdom of Israel restored in the territory formerly occupied by them. It's the Hebrew kingdom represented and referenced many times in Eureka. Brother Thomas says this in Help Us Israel. If we lose Israel, we lose the truth. Notice what he says. It is named up as Israel or Israel's hope because the kingdom which it treats is that which belonged is longed for by all intelligent Israelites and for which, said Paul, I'm bound with these chains. Brethren, this is in the introduction. Listen closely to these words. Elpis Israel's subject matter is national. Period. 
not sectarian, period. I know that's an emphasis I put there. It's not about a Christadelphian community. It's not about a movement or a denomination. The Bible is not about that. It's about a nation. It treats of a nation and its civil and ecclesiastical institutions in a past and future age. I've been talking about this at length the last several months with Brother Colin Hollenby. We have changed a lot of the parables of Christ to apply to the ecclesia when they were applied to Israel and the kingdom and how it changed in AD 70. And you can find that in a lot of writings of Christadelphian going back in the late 1800s, mid 1800s, even in the turn of the century. Elpis Israel's subject matter is national. We are about a kingdom restored that was Israel in the past. We will occupy the land promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Christ will sit upon the throne of David. And there will be, of course, as he told the 12 disciples, he'll sit upon the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And so are these two rows with six in a row. It is the number of flesh. It's the Jew and Gentile that make this up. And again, remember, brothers and sisters, it is much smaller than the personal offering, personal offering of the altar of burnt offering, which was five cubits square. This one is only two cubits and a cubit in breadth. And sometimes you will hear brethren go on and on and on and on and on about the criticism of the Ecclesia when they themselves are not very good Bible students. On and on and on about the Ecclesia. Our personal conduct, our personal lifestyle, our personal dedication to the truth is far more important than the state of the Ecclesia. The Ecclesia has always been difficult. Any period of time from Israel to any of the epistles written by Paul to, of course, the seven epistles addressed by Christ himself in the apocalypse. What was the makeup of the Ecclesia? You get it in Timothy and Titus. Someone's appointment was based upon their personal individual life. How did they conduct themselves? What did the person without say about? Them? How were they married? What was the behavior of their children? What was their demeanor? Were they quick to anger? Were they brawlers? It had nothing to do about arranging boards and young people's gatherings. And it, it had to do with the individual conduct of those brethren. He doesn't get into all the ecclesial affairs. They will take care of themselves. He gets into the individuals involved. And that who is, is who leads the ecclesia. And sadly, that slipped from our presence today. Brother Robert said this. Where do we look for the real state of the Ecclesia? We find it in the individual lives of the brethren. You follow them during their week. What do they do when they're thrown upon their own resources? Forget about complaining about the Ecclesia. How do they act? What do they do with their leisure time and surplus money? How do they transact their business and go about work? Are they constant in prayer, abounding there into thanksgiving, ready for every good work? Or does the word of God go ne neglected in their houses while they bestow all their energies on business or work or friends or family or pleasure? Do they have the likeness of Christ who came not to be ministered unto, but to minister? Do they not realize that they're strangers and pilgrims and stewards of the goodness of God? Remember, remember brothers and sisters, the question is, how do we look for the real state of the Ecclesia? Brother Robert said the individuals, because the altar of burnt offering is bigger than the table of showbread. And by the way, one time a week, eating of fellowship there, Aaron and his sons, the altar burnt offering was a lot more frequent. It was addressed more frequently than the table of showbread. It's about how we live our personal lives. And there's a reason they ate only in the holy place, brothers and sisters, because we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. There's, it's exactly what Brother Robert says in the Ecclesial Guide that individual meetings are unlawful. Um, we do come together for a very express purpose. And that's something we'll leave for a different time. Unleavened cakes, a fine flour. 
We mentioned this very quickly. We'll mention it very quickly here. We mentioned it last time, brothers and sisters. Talking about it is frequent when brethren say, all someone has to do if they're going astray is come back to the meeting. Just come back to the meeting. Just come back to the meeting. And I've even heard that said when a brother or sister is living with a girlfriend or something in the world. And that's folly, brothers and sisters. They're unleavened cakes. You don't want that leaven to affect the whole lump. And he says, I wrote in the epistle not to keep company with fornicators. And I'm not talking about the people of the world. I'm talking about people that are in the truth. That's the ones that if a brother's called a fornicator, covetous, idolater, railer, drunkard, extortionate, don't eat with them. It's the individual conduct that we really need to focus on, brothers and sisters. If the hand of the foot offends thee, lest it cast the whole body into the fire, cut it off. So is the parable of Matthew 5, verse 30. So we do have very important individual responsibility, of course, as that initial quote said by uh, Brother Mansfield from the Expositor. And so we move on to the lampstand, also in the holy place. We won't have time to get to the altar of uh, incense. Thou shalt make a lampstand. And again, it's not made of wax, so it's a lampstand. It's made of oil, of pure gold, beaten work. We have it in our King James's candlestick. It's beaten work, and it was made up of his shaft and his branches. It wasn't just seven equal branches, brothers and sisters. It was a shaft and six branches, although they were to be made of the same. And we're told in the Apocalypse, again, the book of Revelation, so frequently as it does, defines the principles of the tabernacle. So the apocalypse, which you cannot understand without an understanding of the law and prophets, goes all the way back to the second book of the Bible to establish principles for which the basis of the apocalypse is going to be founded. And in chapter one, it does it. It does it with the condition and the principles dealing with the lampstand. And this shaft is very, very important. It's the same word. And the Old Testament scripture in Hebrews that is quoted in Exodus 1 and Genesis 46 that says, out of the loins of Jacob came 70 souls. And out of this shaft came six branches. And who are the branches? They're the brethren of Christ. They're the six. They are flesh who are incomplete, brothers and sisters, without that seven. We know what six represents. And there's no need to shy away from that number. Just like the 12, 12 cakes were assembled in two rows of six, we know we are flesh and we are incomplete without that table of showbread and the hope of Israel. Without the shaft, the Christ, we are very incomplete. They are just like, just like the showbread, the hope of Israel divided into two. It's the same thing with the six branches. They're divided into two. There are three branches that come out of one side, and there are three branches that come out of the other. And we've talked about this before, that the number three represents death to the flesh and resurrection. So they are those that have associated with Christ by being baptized into his name, Romans 6, of course. And out of his side, that's how Eve was formed. So they are members by principles of baptism, death to the flesh and the old man, crucifixion to that man and rising in a newness of life and a new walk that are born out of the shaft. And that deep sleep that came upon the last Adam figuratively to bring to life out of the side of the shaft, giving birth to the ecclesia. And that's what happened in Christ. So these six branches come out of the lampstand. And the lampstand is sustained by the shaft that bears the oil. And so, brothers and sisters, seven is the complete number. If you remove Christ as the shaft, and brothers and sisters, you know what I mean when I say this. And this is not meant to humiliate any of us, although it should humble all of us. How often is the Ecclesia a place 
that has nothing to do with Christ. It's either just on social grounds. And I will tell you personally, brothers and sisters, I'm very careful the way I use the term fellowship. If we're just getting together to have a barbecue and maybe go fishing, it, I am very hesitant personally to call that fellowship because that can go very astray into carnal things very quickly. This is about one that walks in the midst of the lampstands, brothers and sisters. If the shaft is not the foremost feeding oil of the light, and if he is not the center that feeds the branches, it is a church. And that happens very often. And you will notice in the apocalypse, and by the way, it's the same in Daniel. We were just taken through this Thursday night in the Birmingham Amended Statement of Faith classes by Brother Colin Hollenby, where he addressed Daniel chapter 6. If you haven't seen it, go back and look at the class on that. It should be available um, in video form, where it's all about the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. The first chapters, 1 through 6 of Daniel, are about the brethren and how they deal with the Babylonian apostasy. Before you get into all the details of Bible prophecy of the movement of the nations, the book of Revelation is the exact same. Until you get even to the harlot system and the movement of the, the European nations, the wilderness, so to speak, what's addressed first is the ecclesia. And it is in both of those prophetic books that ultimately deal with the nations. And you will notice also classes today that are dealing with so-called signs of the times in Bible prophecy. We almost skipped clean past the exhortations that deal with the state of the brotherhood leading up to that. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Isaiah, they all begin with a rebuke of the ecclesia and the state of the brotherhood. And we seem just to pass right over that to get to national signs of the times dealing with other nations. We have to remember the shaft and where the focus of Yahweh was first in Daniel and where it was first in the apocalypse it was the ecclesia. And we know to bear fruit we have got to be branches that come out of the vine of Christ. And we had these almonds and these flowers coming out of this most ornate thing called the lampstand. Almonds and the flowers, the symbols of life, the branches that would be purged, and they'd be purged according to the word, so that bore more fruit. So that the trials and the difficulties that we go through, brothers and sisters, is so that we manifest more the character of Yahweh's anointed and skin off more of the flesh in our own life. So there will be a knop under two of the branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the lampstand. And it was to be of all one beaten work of pure gold. The seven lamps, they shall light the lamps thereof, that they will give light over against it. Even the tongs and soft dishes, pure gold, a town of pure gold shall he make it with all the vessels. So there to be one, there will be of one beaten work. And by the way, there's no wood at this structure. And you go, well, wait a minute. There's no shittim wood at the core of this. It's different. But we acknowledge that we are all flesh, brothers and sisters. We acknowledge that we number six coming out of the shaft. We acknowledge that we are not perfect. And that the one that we remember, the shaft, is perfect and altogether without blemish. And it's pure gold. But yet we know that we're marked by the number six. It's so that we strive for the things eternal, brothers and sisters. If you've ever heard them, either in broadcast form, on the radio or whatever, or read, read their print of the church preachers of today, they go on and on about, oh, poor, woe is me, oh, sinful man that I am. And they go on and on about, forgive me, God, I'm a sinner, to stir the emotions. We acknowledge that, brothers and sisters. But our focus in the ecclesia, we could do that too. The Apostle Paul lists at length, when he talks about the brethren that come into the truth, 
when he says in 1 Corinthians 5, I believe it is, you may want to turn there real quickly. Because I've said this to a couple of brothers and sisters in private conversation. Where he talks about, <clears throat> know ye not that unrighteousness shall not inherit the, the kingdom of God? Neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, nor effeminates, abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkeners, revilers, extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11, and such were some of you, but you were washed and sanctified. Where are the examples of all those? Where are the examples in scriptures of all the adulterers and the fornicators and the effeminates and the abusers of themselves? But that is not the focus of the truth, brothers and sisters. This, there would be not enough volumes to consume the Bible if we were just to focus on the sin of men. That principle is addressed absolutely over and over again. Our focus is the shaft, God manifestation, and the lampstand, remembering we are marked by the number six. We understand where all those things God is not interested in that. And people will even point out to justify sin. Well, you know, David sinned. Well, you know what Paul did. Well, you, you know what Solomon did. And they say, well, there's not a single sin in the Bible that has not been recorded of one of God's saints. There's not a single sin in the Bible that is not common to man. Among Yahweh's saints that hasn't been a tone for. That's the principle. He has cleansed us from all unrighteousness. We have to have the faith conviction to believe, 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 through 10, that he can cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's the sin that's been a tone for, not the sin that's happened. So it's of one beaten work of pure gold, well, we repeat again, brothers and sisters, how is gold produced? Through trial. Yeah, but the ecclesia is supposed to be a utopia. I challenge that, brothers and sisters. I don't believe so. I don't believe that has ever been the intent of the ecclesia. If there are scriptures in a series of them that says that, I mean this sincerely, I would like to know. I don't believe they exist. It's never been intended to be a utopia. He says to the Ecclesia at Laodicea, buy of me gold tried in the fire, so that you realize that you're naked and you're blind, so that you can see. It's not an odd thing that there's heresies among us. Paul is not shocked to hear that. He says, so that they which are approved among you will be manifest. And by the way, that word approved, as it's used here ecclesially, is the same one represent tried under trial in James 1 verse 12. It's the purpose. The ecclesial environment is at large a place of trial and difficulty to develop our character. Here's what John Thomas says. And by the way, this is Eureka. In all the times of the Gentiles, the saints are a mixed community in which are found fish of all sorts, good, bad, and indifferent. 1800s, he wrote this, brothers and sisters. In our generation, as in that of the apostles, the ecclesia or general assembly of many, you are called. It's composed of diverse materials. Any age, he says. And has been thus in all generations before and since Satan in the days of Job, mingled themselves with the sons of deity. When they presented themselves in the divine presence, the satanic element has ever been among them, with its depths as they speak, corrupting and perverting the weak. In the wisdom of the deity, Satan has been permitted to practice and deceive the hearts of simple, the simple who are ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth, without judicial interference. The truth as it is in Jesus is entrusted to the ecclesia or house of the deity. The members of this house are held responsible and accountable for their relations to this. Again, John Thomas Eureka. As a treasure committed to them to be contended for earnestly and to be upheld at all hazards 
in their day and generation. This house being furnished with vessels, he says, of all sorts, some to honor, some to dishonor. The truth receives a characteristic treatment at the hands of each sort. From these premises, it is inevitable that, as Paul says, heresies will be among you. They are permitted to exist. Though not approved, their existence arouses the flagging energies of the sterling and faithful men. It sets them to contending more earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints, Jude 2, which manifests them as the approved. This was the manifestation of the approved after this process is one reason why Yahweh keeps silence and he permits Satan to continue in their operation among the sons of the deity without any present judicial interference. Why did he permit contemporary Pharisees, legalists, Judaizers, and scribes contemporary with the Lord Jesus Christ? Why did he permit so many false prophets saying everything is fine in the truth during the days of Jeremiah and Ezekiel when they were trying to warn the brethren? Why did Yahweh permit that? Why wasn't there at least silence? Why does he permit a contemporary alternate, and I'll call it what it is, a very liberal view of the truth? Brother Purse Mansfield says, God permits the uprise of false teachers to prove those that have the truth, that they may show themselves worthy of the kingdom. All will be tested or proved in some way or the other. The testing is designated or designed to purify characters for the kingdom. Under the trial of Abraham, demonstrated his worthiness to receive the promises made conditionally to him at the beginning of his pilgrimage. It not only assisted to perfect his character, but was an open witness to his example of faith unto all. So Paul says to the Galatians, I marvel that you so soon remove from the gospel of grace from which you've been called. And grace, Christ, is what they fell back to legalism in the truth. It was permitted, brothers and sisters, any period of time. Remember, it's an ecclesia of gold and how that is processed. The ecclesial died by Brother Roberts. The ministration of the Spirit at this present divine authority in the ecclesias continued during the days of the apostles and the generation next ensuing. And Brother Roberts applies a type and parable in the ecclesial guide. He says, after that, an apostasy rose in the apostolic community after the analogy of the case of Israel in the first settlement of Canaan. When they served the Lord all the days of Joshua and the elders that outlived him, who had seen all his great works in the land that he had done for Israel. But the apostasy prevailed more and more as the apostles by the spirit predicted would be the case until all trace of the primitive truth had disappeared and the spirit of the Lord was withdrawn from all association with an empty Christian name. So he applies the type of Joshua and the elders that outlive them. And then, of course, they went on to serve other gods, just as with Christ and the apostles. And that's in the importance, I, I believe, brothers and sisters, in understanding type and anti-type. And the, ter the parables and the types and the shadows and the allegories and all the principles associated with those in the Old Testament scriptures, because they're spoken everywhere by the pioneer brethren. And so the lampstand had two aspects. I'll go through this rather quickly as time permits, brothers and sisters. We had its structure, and then the next thing that we had, we had the contents of it. And the contents were pure oil, olive, beaten for the light. And just recently in a class, Sunday school class on Zechariah, Brother David uh, Perry was sharing this with us when he actually went to Israel and reviewed the process by which this is uh, this oil is gotten. It's a very hard substance, brother, brothers and sisters. So it has to be beaten out. Remember, the lampstand is a beaten gold to be one piece. That's funny. And actually, the contents were to be of pure oil, olive beaten for light. It's something that can't be gotten through casual arrangement, brothers and sisters. And it was set in order, an arrangement. And you know, that's exactly the language that Paul uses. 
he says to Titus, I put thee in Crete to set in order in the Ecclesia things that are lacking. And he said, I believe it's in Corinthians, the things that are lacking, I will put in order when I come in the, to visit the Ecclesia. And it says he set in order, in proper order. The lamps were the only form of light in the holy place. It is the responsibility, brothers and sisters, of each member of the Ecclesia to contribute to the general light. Look what it says in Leviticus 24, the primary quote. Command the children of Israel that they bring it. It wasn't reserved for Aaron and his sons, maybe just the Levites, maybe just the priest, maybe just this tribe. It was all the children of Israel. Everyone is to be contributing to it. And you know what happened? You see it in the apocalypse. You see it in all the ecclesias addressed by Paul. You can see where there are some ecclesias where the members personally, individually beat out the pure oil, olive beaten, and the ecclesias that don't. And again, it's associated with the hope of Israel because it is the very thing that Romans 11 cites as the natural branches broken off of Israel and the wild branches graft in. It's still related to the hope of Israel. And of course, when Noah brings forth the dove, she comes back with an olive leaf in her mouth. It's the restoration of Israel as the chronology of that particular parable. The word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a light and truth. The commandment is a lamp. David was a lamp in Israel. Paul was a light unto the Gentiles. Christ himself was a light, brothers and sisters. And this is what Brother Robert says in the Law of Moses. The only light we can have at this present is the light of illuminated brains. It's not a fixed light. This Bible right here is not light in and of itself. It is not light in itself. Read what Brother Roberts is saying. It's a light that requires constant renewal by supplying it daily. Remember, every morning and every evening, it said. Every morning and every evening, it was to be supplied. Order the lamps of the pure lampstand from the evening unto the morning before Yahweh continually is the type, says Brother Roberts. Nothing less than the daily reading of the word can answer to this type. It emphasizes the declaration of David, the entrance of thy words giveth light. And so that's where we stand, brothers and sisters. The expositor by Brother Mansfield, gold, the result of faith tried and purified, the lampstand, the most beautiful and elaborate of all the pieces of the furniture, was not cast into a mold nor made in sections, but it was beaten into its form and beauty out of a solid piece of gold. The light that caused that combustion of the oil supplied in the lamps, as Brother Roberts, was a lampstand, and it doesn't represent the, the word in the abstract, but it's incorporated in living believers. It is manifest that the word of the Lord cannot have, can have no operative existence. It can have no operative existence apart from living reflectors. Paul was a light to the Gentiles. Christ, because the word was in him, was a light of the world. David, because he was an eater of the word, was the lamp of Israel. He's saying that it has to be incorporated into the living believers. It cannot have any operative existence apart from a living reflector. Inspiration itself is but intelligence of God apart from a living medium. It's in the abstract. And when this inspiration acting through the prophet and apostles, and apostles had incorporated itself into writing, the writing was not in itself the light, but the means, he says, the mere means of light when it enters into the knowledge and understanding of living believers. What an intelligent, enlightened statement by Brother Roberts. What an enlightened statement, brothers and sisters, and how he understood this parable of the tabernacle, this mosaic parable as he styles it. I am the light of the world. Anyone that follows him cannot walk in darkness. He can't walk. So it's a walk and we have to walk in light. That's a living reflector, brothers and sisters. And that's what he's talking about. And so that we read in Acts chapter 20, when they came together on the first day of the week, 
and the disciples came together to break bread. By spirit inspiration, Acts records there were many lights in the upper chamber. Remember the staves that went in to the table of showbread so that they may lift it up, it says, and what those staves represented? Why was it that Christ broke bread in the upper chamber? And why was it that those staves were there to lift up the table of showbread? It wasn't even that big and heavy. One person could have carried it. It's so that brethren elevate above the earthy the principles of the truth. You know, we can talk amongst ourselves and secular things, and we do. How's the job going? How's this going? How's the family? That's wonderful. In the state of the Ecclesia, the focus is the shaft and Yahweh and the living illumination of the truth. That's what it's about, brothers and sisters. And here's the, I believe, the final reference that we have, and I think it's the one we have time for. Because I believe that lamp, first and foremost, that light in the Ecclesia, is the enlightenment of understanding the law and prophets concerning Christ. And I want to prove that by Luke 24. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them all scriptures of the things concerning himself. And you remember what's happening in this case. Their eyes were withholding because they didn't believe it. They thought it had been him that would redeem Israel. And they're walking by the way. And it says, but when they went aside and he took bread and blessed it and break it, a quote, of course, for his breaking of bread in the emblems and gave it to them, quote verbatim, their eyes were opened and they knew him. And just like the first century, he vanished out of their sight. And it said, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us, by the way, and opened to us the scriptures? Remember what Brother Robert says about an enlightened it illuminations. That word burn within us is the same word, light the lamp, in the references you have before you on the screen. It's understanding the shaft in the lampstand. The Jewish assembly was called a synagogue, not an ecclesia. They did not understand the law and the prophets and psalms concerning Christ, and their heart could not burn within them, and their eyes and enlightenment could not be opened. The context is the understanding of the scriptures. And that light is the knowledge of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And then we have, in conclusion, this warning. And I will just say this in these last few quotes because time has expired. We have this in Exodus 24, verse 40. Make sure that you make it ex exactly according to the pattern. Make sure that you arrange it according to Yahweh before him continually. And you get it again here in Exodus 25, verse 40, uh, which we just cited, and Numbers 8. And the context in those cases is the lampstand. Here it is, the light of the lampstand, Numbers chapter 8, verse 4. And then again, the warning, make it according to the pattern that Yahweh showed thee, and showed to Moses. That's according to the pattern that he made the lampstand. So why the emphasis? I believe that appears seven times in scriptures, the warning to make it absolutely after the pattern that Yahweh showed him. Why the overemphasis when it comes to the lampstand of the occurrence of that warning to make it according to the pattern? Because brothers and sisters, these little things that we've implemented into the Ecclesia, these little programs and little organizations and little so-called fraternal offerings that we've established out of the brotherhood, which, by the way, are after the pattern of the churches, are not according to the pattern that Yahweh showed Moses of how absolutely the lampstand should be made. So if we wonder why there are problems in the truth today, brothers and sisters, it's because we've swerved from the exact pattern that we're given in scriptures of how the lampstand's gonna be organized. Go back and read Timothy, 
and Titus. Corinthians is certainly an example of that, and of course the Acts of the Apostles. You will find so many things in our ecclesial organization today that are nowhere to be found in the scriptures. I'm not saying the in and of themselves they may be wrong. I'm saying you will be surprised of not only the phrases by which we name those things and where we got those phrases, but the actual organizations themselves and where they came from. Did they come from the pattern of the lampstand? Or were they borrowed from the church? God willing, next time, brothers and sisters, we will go into the subject matter of the lampstand.